number tonight. Uh, if we can just do the same thing next week, and hopefully a lot of visitors will come for the meeting, we can really pack this place out next Sunday night. Uh, the title of our lesson this evening is uh, Don't Miss the Whole Point. Uh, part of the idea for this lesson came uh, actually when uh, Charlie came up to me a few weeks ago, and it was after I did a le the lesson on counting the cost for following Jesus, and he told me that I had left something out of my lesson outline. And I said, I left something out? What are you talking about? On that lesson, we examined the idea of recognizing the cost of following Jesus and how it's, it's good to have an understanding of the life that you will live after baptism, faithful until death. Uh, and it's good to have that understanding before committing to it in baptism. In that lesson, we, we went over three different points that summarize your life after your baptism and the conditions of the covenant that must be upheld faithfully for the rest of your days. We talked about, number one, your new moral obligations upon rising up out of the waters of baptism. It's important to understand that before you go down into the water. Number two, your new religious obligations. And number three, that this whole lifestyle must be upheld faithfully until death. Uh, but in fact, as I was going over these three points, Charlie pointed out to me that I had neglected to talk about uh, the one most important commandment in my outline under any of these three points, I had left it out, which Jesus called the greatest commandment. I uh, did not purposefully, by the way, leave out the first and great commandment or the second, which is like it. Um, it just sort of slipped my mind to put it in the structure of that lesson. But Charlie said, you, one thing you did forget to talk about was love, upon which the whole covenant and all the commandments stand. And I said, well, yes, I, I definitely could have and probably should have put that in the list somewhere since love is the most important of all the commandments and linked to all the commandments. So that's sort of the theme of tonight's lesson. That is to remind us as Christians not to ever miss this point. Uh, as we follow the whole covenant, don't miss the whole point, which is love. Uh, I'll give you the two theme Bible passages for this evening as we start, uh, and then I'll make some applications. So the first passage, of course, is Matthew chapter 22, 34 through 40. It says, But when the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. Then one of them, a lawyer, uh, asked him a question, testing him, and saying, Teacher, which is the great commandment of the, or in the law of Moses? In other words, what, what's the most important of all the commandments? That's a pretty good question. Uh, Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. Love God. And the second, by the way, and he didn't ask this question, but Jesus said, Here's the second great commandment, a greatest commandment. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And who is your neighbor? Well, anybody of humanity can be considered my, my neighbor. And he said, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. And so as we have discussed all the other commandments together in that particular lesson that we preached on counting the cost, I didn't mean to, but I forgot to mention the backbone commandment behind everything upon which all the other commandments lie and the reason we perform all these other commandments. Uh, it is the commandment of love. The other theme passage for tonight, which I think sums up the topic very well, is 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 1 through 3, uh, coming from the love chapter of the Bible. Paul says, Hey, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, and have, but have not love, it profits me nothing. So the point of tonight's lesson is uh, wrapped up very well in verse 3, which we just read. Said, and he said, hey, as I go about performing all the commandments of the Lord faithfully, in diligence and in discipline, if I don't have love while I do it, 
it profits me nothing. So here we see the concept of performing the commandments given from heaven and doing them, performing the commandments, maybe trusting God, maybe having great faith. But if they're not done out of love, uh, it does you no good. They're not acceptable. Therefore, we could go back and go through that counting the cost lesson and go through every single commandment, maybe even the lesson this morning, and point out that if we don't have love motivating each action we do, then our obedience won't benefit because it must be out of love that we do these things. So in fact, if we do not love, though we outwardly perform these things, then God cannot count us as faithful if we don't have love. So tonight, I want to talk about how uh, we must not miss the whole point of of God of studying God's standard uh, and, and seeking to cling to the conditions of the covenant and obedience. Uh, if I have not love, it profits me nothing. First uh, Corinthians thirteen three. So one more thing I will mention as we start. Uh, I think this goes along with it as well. I want to quickly talk about the plan of salvation in this discussion. Uh, I was studying with a young man one time. He was actually older than me, but I'm a young man too. So uh, I was trying to teach him the gospel. And he said, Travis, I don't agree with the way you teach the plan of salvation. I thought to myself, I've never heard that before. Um, that's a joke. I, I, heard, I hear that all the time. Uh, but he, he brought up an objection to me about the plan of salvation that was actually different than the people I've studied with before. And he said, you've left something out of the plan of salvation. I've never heard someone tell me I've left something out. I've heard people say that we put too much in the plan of salvation. I said, well, what did I leave out? He said, well, love. Love for God and love for man, the two greatest commandments. And I said, well, I certainly agree that a person cannot get into heaven without having love for God and love for man at the root of all their obedience and faith. And really the conclusion that I came, uh, came to about our five-step plan of salvation that we show from Scripture is that love is actually wrapped up in the repentance step of the plan of salvation uh, that you take part in before your baptism, uh, which is the third step there in the, the little staircase. Uh, you must have a change of mind from the life that you've been living and that change of mind is your repentance. And within that would include someone who previously did not love God and did not properly love man. But now having a change of mind, they are determined to profess that they do love God and they have a change of mind about that. Um, and so really the great commandment is wrapped up still in the plan of salvation. Uh, but if you ever wanted to say, hear, believe, repent, love God, confess, and be baptized. I don't suppose I'd have any problem with that. Uh, but have a change of mind. You're, you've got to be a new creature, and part of that is love. Uh, but I did find this objection interesting nonetheless. Uh, sometimes we forget to talk about how important it is. We talk about all the other commandments, and we, forgot, we forget sometimes that uh, in all of our faith, in all of our obedience, that we're supposed to be motivated by the all-important commandment to love God and love one another. All the commandments hinge on those two things. If I have not love while I do these things, it profits me nothing. Uh, as we seek to follow God's will, we must not forget the command to love as we perform all the others. And if we love Christ, we will keep his commandments. By the way, uh, John chapter 14, verse 15, if you love me, then you will keep my commandments. Uh, but in truth, all of the commandments cannot properly be upheld acceptably if love is not in the picture. Uh, for, first Peter chapter one is also a good passage for this. It says this to Christian. It says, since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit, the Holy Spirit, through or in sincere love of the brethren, do what? Love one another fervently with a pure heart. That's the outcome. Since you've obeyed the truth, then love each other. Having been born again, that's the outcome, having been born again. Not of the corruptible seed, but of an incorruptible seed through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. The root of Christianity uh, and the, living the Christian life must be a loving life, loving each other. Okay, so for the rest of our lesson tonight, here's the route we'll take. I have uh, 13 points that we can apply this to, to the Christian life. Uh, we surely 
could add more to this list, uh, but I think this will be enough to get the point across. So 13 points, here's how we'll break it down. Uh, don't forget love in all of these things. Number one, first, your good works. Don't forget as you do good and do good works for other people that you're doing good for other people because you love them and because you love God. This morning we talked about Matthew 25 when Jesus uh, tells the righteous the reasoning behind why they'll be entering in. And he listed the six, uh, we listed the six things that Jesus talked about to sum up their life of service and love. And he said, number one, you're entering in because you fed the hungry, just like I asked you to. You, number two, gave drink to the thirsty. That was your whole way of life, serving people. You housed travelers. You clothed those who were naked. You visited the sick. You visited those who were in prison. And Jesus' reasoning says that's the fundamental reason why you're living in, why you're entering in is because you served me like this. And you did good for other people. But you know what? We also read about some individuals in Scripture who helped others out. Uh, but listen, they weren't going, they, the people who helped other people in Scripture weren't doing it because they loved the souls they were helping or because they loved God, but they did it for their own glory and to be seen by men. Uh, Matthew chapter 6 is one instance of that. Uh, verses 2 through 4, Jesus said, Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, Right? If you're going to go and if you're going to help someone who's poor and you're going to give charity, uh, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets. And he's poking at the Pharisees who would do that. They start a parade so that people would know when they're about to go give to a poor person or give at the temple. He said, don't do that. Some do that that they may have glory from men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But when you do a charitable deed as followers of me, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, that your charitable deed may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will himself reward you openly. So what were the Pharisees and some others doing with regards to their good works? Well, they were giving to the poor. They were contributing uh, charitable donations, giving from their own pocket, which is great. And their money was probably ended up being used to help people. But guess what? They had no actual love or concern for the people that they were helping with their money. Uh, you see, they did the act, the outward act, the display. But the motivation for doing the act was not in love, but it was really to glorify themselves. They were giving to benefit them. And that was their pure motivation. Therefore, it was not pleasing to God. It wasn't done out of love. Uh, consider the wording that we just read from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 3. Paul said, again, And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, but have not love, it profits me nothing. That's the same topic that we're talking about. So I say, man, listen, I can give all my goods to the poor. You remember Jesus told the rich young ruler that that's what he would need to do if he would enter into the kingdom of heaven. He had to rip the love of money out of his heart so he could be pleasing to God. He said, go and sell all that you have, give to the poor, you'll have treasure in heaven. Well, here's someone Paul hypothetically talks about, and he says, you know, let's say that somebody does what the rich young ruler was asked to do. Then they give away all that they have. Right, there is still a way in which even that won't be pleasing to God. Well, what is it? If they're not doing it for love's sake. Uh, isn't it interesting that you can give your whole livelihood away to someone else, to someone who needs it, and you can still have different motives in your heart that make that action unacceptable? But what are some of the motivations that someone could have? for giving and not being acceptable. Well, God said, I, if I'm not giving and if I'm not a generous person, I'm not going to heaven. Well, I guess I need to be generous then. But deep inside, you aren't truly doing it out of love or concern for the poor. You're not doing it for concern for other people. You're, you're concerned for yourself. Jesus says, that service isn't pleasing to God. 
Paul says, if, if you give all your goods to feed the poor, but have not love, it profits you nothing. So that's the idea. And this is what happened to Ananias and Sapphira in Acts chapter 5, a really good example of that. They gave a mighty donation to the Lord's cause because they wanted to be seen by men. The previous chapter, chapter Barnabas had just sold, sold and laid down a possession at the apostles' feet. Probably people looked at that and, wow, that was a wonderful work. And people probably were talking about how great that was. I think they wanted in on some, some of that chirp and chatter about the good deed. Uh, and in fact, in fact, they even lied about how much they gave so that they could look better. And they held back some, but they said, we gave all. Uh, so we learned that their motivation was not to bring glory to the Lord's church. Their motivation wasn't because they wanted to help those in need. Their motivation was to make themselves look good. And that's not love. Uh, Jesus says, when you help someone, why do you do it? Why do you help? And it is simply, hey, is it just to check a box so you can do it off your to-do list so that you make sure you go to heaven? Or how about you actually have the mindset of Christ? I want you to help the poor person because I pity the poor person in that lowly estate. That's why I want you to help the poor. I care about them. I, I, I hurt to see what they're going through, and it pains me to see them hurting. And that's love. That's the idea of love. First John chapter 3, and verse 17 says, But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? James chapter 2, 15 and 16, If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? So the Bible says the love of God should motivate you to do good for other people. And it's not just because it's a duty. That shouldn't be our whole way of life. Jesus says, you know, when you uh, visit somebody who is sick, are you just doing it to check off a box from your to-do list? Or are you doing it because you actually wish to help uplift a person who is hurting. Uh, just this last week, uh, a couple of us had a chance to go visit some who are in the hospital. Um, I, I had a chance to visit two Christian sisters from our congregation who were in the hospital. And, you know, I'm the preacher, by the way. That's my job. I'm just kidding. It's, it's all Christians' jobs, right? Uh, but one of them was a Sister Dean Clowers. And, and I know some of you guys got to go see her in the hospital who had suffered a stroke. And the other sister I got to go see was Kathy when she was in there for a little while, for two days in Genesis, having her heart trouble. Um, you know, it, I think it's easy for a Christian to think about uh, a trip to the hospital as a duty that needs to be checked off a box. But, you know, while I was at the hospital, um, I realized when I was there how much I cared about the two sisters I, that I went to visit. And I hated to see them hurting. And I was happy to try to encourage them. You know, Dean looked at me and held my hand. And she couldn't talk anymore due to the stroke that she had suffered. Uh, but I knew how much she would have loved to talk to me. I saw her gears turn. and She wanted to communicate to me and they probably had questions she wanted to ask. Uh, and my heart just went out to her in that condition. And I was sad for her. I wanted her to know that I, I was sorry for what she was going through. Uh, and many of you have gone through similar things. And sometimes that, going back to the pain and suffering lesson that we uh, went through a few weeks ago, sometimes that's why God allows us to struggle so that we can know what it's like to be in the hospital. I was in the hospital five, six years ago when I had the MRSA in my nose, and I hated it. I said, man, any chance I get to get to go visit someone in the hospital, now I get it. I, did, I was like, what's the point of visiting somebody in the hospital? But I wanted Dean, for example, to know I was, I was sorry for what she was going through. And I was just happy about her recent baptism that she had at age 93. And that we got her in that water and time and she responded to the gospel. And Kathy, who had been dealing with so many 
who has been consistently dealing with so many health health issues, it was nice to get to go and visit with my aunt Kathy and my uncle Wayne, who I care about deeply. I said, we you know we hate to see people who we love going through hard things. And the idea of this lesson is to seek to do good, not just as a duty, uh, not just because we have to do it, but because we actually love each other. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10, which we quoted this morning, says that God designed us for this reason as his church. It says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Uh, point number two uh, on this list is evangelism. I think this is, a, is an important point. Now, we've been talking about recently, uh, this year, a lot about our duty in evangelism. That, hey, you know, we actually had a lesson. Is it a sin if we don't evangelize? And you see, this too is a task that Christians can take part in, but maybe not out of love. We've got to be careful about our mind as we reach out to the lost. Perhaps a Christian is finally motivated to evangelize because they've said in their heart, well, I guess I have to. And I'm concerned about my own soul. If I, if I don't do it, then maybe I'll go to hell if I don't even try. So I'm going to try. And it's just interesting that we can be motivated to evangelize because we're more worried about our souls than the souls we're trying to reach. No, when we sit down with people, when we give out invitations to study, or we, we, we give out invitations to, for people to come to this gospel meeting for next week, uh, let's try to be motivated, not merely by our desire not to go to hell, but by our desire for them not to go to hell. That's love. Right? Caring and concern. Don't just have concern for yourself, but have concern for other people. That's what... God wanted the mindset to be. And that's why Jesus evangelized. Right? He said, you know, I'm sitting down with you and I'm going to talk kindly to you. I'm going to be gentle and, and take you through the, the truth. I'm not going to belittle you, but I'm going to talk to you like a precious soul that has an eternity that's waiting for them. I want you to hear the truth. Uh, so that's supposed to be our motivation in evangelism. Perhaps some evangelize, just like the Pharisees did their service, maybe some evangelize to be seen by men. Wow. Brother so-and-so studied with 50 people in 2023. He sure did a great service for, for Jesus Christ. You see, what's our motivation for doing the things that we do? Now, remember, God hates a prideful outlook on life. God hates when our goal for doing his commandments is to be esteemed by others for doing the commandments. That's why in many different places he said, well, do these things in secret so that your right hand doesn't know what your left hand is doing and vice versa. And so he hates it when we focus on bringing glory to ourselves for our good works and our, and our obedience and not bringing glory to him and not for the sake of those who were serving. Uh, and he's looking at these things. So we ought to ask ourselves in all of our service, as I obey the commandments, is love the guiding motivation in my heart? Or is it some other reason? Am I doing the services because I love people and I love God? Or is it because I want to look good? Uh, number three is preaching. 2 Timothy 2, 4, uh, Paul said, preach the word, be ready in season, out of season, convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. So we, you know, we've been having a lot of lessons about uh, gospel preaching recently. We had a, ser a sermon series on the lessons that we've been preaching. Um, but yes, just like the Pharisees, it could be said about the preachers in the Lord's church. Uh, elders, song leaders, or those who lead public prayers, get up in front of people. Uh, some fall victim to doing these services for prideful reasons rather than love for the audience and love for God. Uh, Justin and I talk about this all the time. Think of a song leader who gets up with great swelling pride in their heart, desiring most of all to show the crowd how good his voice is. Or the preacher who finally gets a platform to show how well he knows the scripture, how smart he is. No, being a preacher, uh, leading a song, 
or doing any other service, leading a public prayer, is not, none, of, none of these feats are supposed to be for the individual doing them. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 5, we reference, says, and, and when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets, that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. So listen, leading a prayer and delivering the preaching, we've got to be careful, uh, those who do it, it's not for our glory. Um, and God's looking for that. So when a preacher gets up and, and, and he gets a, a message ready for the flock of God, and uh, you know he gets a mighty outline that's impressive and it's straightforward and to the point with the Scripture, uh, he, he uses his talent to instruct and edify the flock. Hopefully he's doing that out of concern for their souls and not to boost a preacher's big ego, right? Uh, so I fear that many fine gospel preachers on the day of judgment will, to their own surprise and to the surprise of others, will miss out on heaven uh, because they were motivated by selfish desires to be esteemed highly and not out of love for God and man. So don't miss the whole point in your Christianity. Uh, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. That's why you do everything you do. Love for God and love for your fellow man. On these two commands hang all the law and the prophets. First Timothy 1.5 says, Now the purpose of the commandment, the, the, this lifestyle that's been given to Christians, the purpose is love from a pure heart, from a good conscience, and from sincere faith. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 1, let brotherly love continue. So all our service is because we love one another and because we love God. Uh, and by the way, I could take a short side note here to mention that today's world uh, thinks that they know what love is, but they really don't. The world's definition of love and God's definition of love are very, two very different things. Uh, many people... Uh, many believe the response to true love for someone else is just accepting everything that they do, letting them do whatever they want, not speaking against what they do. And because of this, the world becomes tolerant of sin in the name of love. I don't speak against these things because I love people. But I'm here to tell you that the true definition of love does not fit that because this, I would say, is closer to the true definition of love. Uh, caring for someone out of concern for their eternal soul, not just their temporary comfort on the earth. That's true love. So you see, uh, it's, it's not a loving thing to show someone that you accept their sinful choices. Because in turn, because of their sinful choices, they'll wind up in hell. You don't you know, and, and it's, 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 it's not a loving thing to promote something that's going to cause someone to wind up in hell. If I love someone, if you love someone, you won't, you don't want them to end up in an uh, eternal place of torment. That is not true love. So this is why we don't accept, you know, some of the recent movements of sin that are out there, like homosexuality and transgenderism not to mention some of the less controversial sins like adultery, good old-fashioned fornication between a man and a woman we also don't stand for, drunkenness, uh, right? So all of these things, if not repented of, will send a person to hell. So love leads a person to preach and to teach about people going to hell. Love tells people about hell, not just heaven. Why? Because we want people to go to hell? No. But because we desperately do not want them to go to hell. You see, that's what true love is and does. Care for someone eternally, not just temporarily. Because eternity, we understand, is much longer than our time that we have on the earth. But do you know what I fear? I fear that those standing on the side of the right will interact with those on the side of the wicked and not be motivated for love out of their immortal souls, but some other motivation. Did you know that it is possible for us to preach truth on these issues uh, and to know them very well 
that sometimes we're actually more excited to win an argument with somebody than we are about guiding them to the right way. All right, listen, these things are wrong. Certainly they're wrong. But when we hate the ones that we preach against, even though our preaching is correct and our teaching is correct, our heart can be wrong if we have hate toward the one involved in the sin. Jesus didn't hate the sinners of this world. He loved them. Therefore, he went to them and told them to repent. Uh, so number four on this list is like uh, the other one, is fighting false teaching. Uh, again, we're told to keep false teaching out of the church, right? Titus chapter 1, verse 11, for there are some whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole households. So false teaching, we could go through that subject, is a very dangerous thing. Uh, but listen, it's an easy thing, like we said moments ago, to get so rehearsed in answering arguments and we become so good at quoting scripture that sometimes we miss the whole point. Love for the person that we're trying to reach on the other side of their poor argument. Now and again, and you know, I, I, I'm not saying be, be kind to the idea of false teaching. No, we need to reject false teaching. Titus chapter 1 and verse 13 actually says, Therefore rebuke them sharply be, uh, that they may be sound in the faith. Right, but, you know, sometimes we rebuke because we love. First, uh, First Timothy chapter 5, verse 20 says, Those who are sinning rebuke in the presence of all that the rest also may fear. Uh, so fight against false teaching because you, pair, you, first off, care about the souls in the church who could be led to hell by false teaching. That's why we hate false teaching so much. But my point is, when we come up against someone who teaches falsely, Consider that the devil is the one who has a hold of them. He's the real enemy. They're someone we love and want to, to get a hold of. Consider that they probably, most people that, a lot of the people that are in error think that they're holding on to the truth. But the devil has tricked them. Therefore, take them aside. Try to talk some sense into them to save their souls. Uh, but don't simply see the argument. See the soul. And see the person that you're trying to reach. I myself think I've been caught up in different times in my past with this mindset uh, that I was more excited to win the argument with someone because, hey, I knew the answer uh, than I was about winning the soul. And shame on us when we start thinking like that because it's easy to do when you know that you have the truth. You can become arrogant because you have the truth. So just picture that soul uh, as upset as their false teaching makes you, and something you can do when you're studying with someone and you're getting upset about what they're saying, something that can help with patience is picture that soul in the torments of hell. And that really should motivate us to take the correct approach and have patience with people and treat them kindly. Uh, we hate what they're standing for. We hate what, how the devil has tricked them, but we need to show love for that individual and say, listen, I love you. And I'm, I'm speaking against what you're saying because I don't want you to go to hell. So we must love those on the opposing side and try to win them over to God. Uh, number five on this list is church leadership, Acts chapter 20 and verse 28. Uh, so Paul said to the Ephesian elders, Therefore, elders, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers over the flock to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. So this could be a reminder to all the elders out there over local congregations. Elders can fall into the Pharisee mindset too, just like a preacher can or a song leader can. Matthew chapter 23, verses 5 and 6 says about the Pharisees, uh, but all their works they do to be seen by men. They make their phylacteries broad and enlarge the borders of their garments. They love the best places at feasts the best seats in the synagogues, greetings in the marketplaces, and uh, to be called by men, Rabbi, Rabbi. So listen, it is possible for elders in the Lord's church to be puffed up with pride for the position that they hold and to continue serving in that position, not out of love for the flock, but out of self-interest and out of power. 
So we better believe that that's the way it is sometimes. And we got to be careful. And remember in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 17 says about elders that they watch out for your souls as those who must give account. So church leadership will give an answer for what they've done in the position of leadership that God gave them. 1 Timothy 1 and verse 5, I'll read it again. It says, Now the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart, from a good conscience, and from sincere faith. So God knows the hearts of all of us, all men. Any position of authority, He puts them in. Uh, He's going to take our hearts and our motivations behind the things we're doing in the judgment day. Uh, Number six on our list is attendance. Uh, Church attendance, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. So did you know that Someone can enter the assembly every week, week in and week out, having perfect attendance, but can fall short in the area of love, both love for God and love for man. Well, it's Sunday again. I guess I have to go to church. I guess I got to get up and gather with the saints because I don't want to go to hell. And I, I think one of the main problems in one who forsakes the assembling is because they're not motivated to go to church because of love for God and love for man. They're motivated for different reasons. So no, God desires that worship be out of love for himself and love for the people we're gathering with. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25, the famous passage we always read about attendance says, and think about it in a different light as we talk about love, says, and let us When we're going to gather together, think about this. Let us consider one another, listen to this phrase carefully, in order to stir up love. In order to stir up love and good works. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. So what is the purpose of our assemblies? Why is part of the reason that we're here tonight Love. Don't miss the whole point for why we come together. We get together and we come here first and foremost to show our appreciation and our love for God. That's the first reason we walk in that door. It should be. But then we also come here to show how much we love and appreciate the brethren, that we can encourage each other. And that was actually the reason. He he doesn't say don't forsake the assembly so you don't go to hell. He says don't don't forsake the, the assembly because you love the brethren. That was the purpose. And by the way, if you go through Scripture, uh, you'll see that God takes it very seriously when we don't have love in our hearts for one another in the church. You know, well, it's Sunday again, but, you know, I love God. I love God, but I hate that old brother so-and-so. The only reason I go is because church is required, and I don't want... Uh, to miss out on on heaven because I didn't go to church, but I can't stand brother so-and-so. God says, if we don't have brotherly love in the church, then you don't love God. Uh, 1 John chapter 4 and verse 20 says, if someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him that uh, he who loves God must love his brother also. There's no way around that. Uh, If you hate your brother in the body of Christ, then how can you say that you love God? Because God loves your brother that you hate. And it could happen that two brothers in the body of Christ might come to every service for years and they might not speak to each other because one of them got offended years ago. But then, you know what? Neither one of their worship will be acceptable before God if they have hatred for one another. So that's why Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verses 23 through 24, using the terminology from Old Testament worship, applying it to New Testament, he says, therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar, if you come to worship, and there remember that your brother has something against you, don't worship. He says, first, leave your gift before the altar and go your way. First, be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift to God. So if you come to worship and you sing every word of these sacred songs, if you take the Lord's Supper, 
If you give an offering, bow your head in prayer, and you listen intently to every sermon, but you have hatred in your heart for the brethren or one of the brethren, then not one ounce of that worship is reaching past the ceiling, and it won't be accepted. 1 John 2, 9 through 11 says, He who says he is in the light uh, and hates his brother is in darkness until now. He who loves his brother abides in the light, and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. So yes, we can come to every single church meeting even and still miss the whole point of true Christianity. Don't miss the point, Christians. The walk that we observe is rooted in love for God and love for our fellow man. Everything draws back to that. Don't ever miss that point. All right, I actually have seven things left on this list. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm going too slow. I'm going to pick it up. Uh, so I'm just going to read these quickly, and then I'm going to touch on one of them in particular, and then we'll close. So number, number seven I had on here, remaining pure, right? The commands, you know, don't, we don't steal. We don't lie. We don't gossip because we love other people. I don't want to steal from someone because I love them. I, I don't want to lie to somebody because I love them. I don't want to gossip. So we don't commit sinful acts with other people like fornication because we don't want them to go to hell either. We, so we love them. And we also love God who wishes us to follow his way. So the reason we stay pure is out of love, again, for God and love for man, part of it. Uh, uh, number eight on the list is study and prayer. You know, you could be a very diligent Bible student and you could know the book so well from cover to cover and you could quote scripture and you could find any passage faster than other people. But if you don't actually apply what we've just been learning about love for people, it profits you nothing. We have to apply what's in the scripture. Uh, the rest of these, number nine, giving I had on the list. Number 10, faithfulness. You, you keep coming to church, you keep reading your Bible and doing all these things for year, years in and years out, uh, but if you don't have love, it profits you nothing. Uh, number 11, church discipline. Number 12, marriage we could talk about. And number 13, I had parenting. Uh, so in each one of these areas of the Christian life, we can sometimes find ourselves doing our duties, yes, but with no motivation of love like we're supposed to. You can be a, a spouse and not have love and just walk through the motions. You can be a parent and do the same thing. All right, so I just wanted to comment for the close, just on number 11, just for one more point that we'll discuss. The Bible says, go to your brother when sin could condemn his soul and urge that brother or sister to repent. Uh, sometimes we call that whole process church discipline. Uh, so here's the question with church discipline. Why do you go to your brother? Why do you go and talk to someone who is caught up in sin? Is it because you're excited to point out that they fell short? Uh, some people it is. Is it because you're glad that you get to feel superior to your brother? More holy? You can point out that they've sinned? No, the Bible says you need to go to your brother or your sister about their sin and all the steps of church discipline. Why? That his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus, 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 5. Right? The reason, you want him to go to heaven. And that's true love. 2 Thessalonians 3, 14 and 15 says, And if anyone does not obey our word in this epistle, note that person and do not keep company with him that he may be ashamed of the way that he's living. Uh, yet do not count him as an enemy, but admonish him as your brother. I saw the purpose for this discipline is still love for your brother's soul and an eternal desire for that individual uh, to get to go to heaven. And that's what all of our motivation is, getting souls to be in a right relationship with God and making sure that we're in a right relationship with God because we want what's best for people. We want souls in heaven. Apostle John wrote, Beloved, let us love one another, for God is love. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. And he who does not love does not know God, for God is love. 1 John 4, 7 and 8. So I urge you this evening with all of the commandments of God that we don't miss the whole point. 
serve God faithfully, but do it out of love and seek uh, the first and second commandment. Uh, So that's our lesson for tonight. If you're not a Christian, the Bible says you need to become part of this awesome kingdom and live faithfully until death uh, after you enter the kingdom. You enter the kingdom by hearing the gospel, believing it, that Jesus Christ died on the cross, came down from heaven to do so. Uh, Repent of your sins. Confess Christ before men. Be baptized in water for the forgiveness of sins. Rising up out of the water, a new creature, having been washed from all your previous sins, and you have access to the blood of Christ all of your days. You just have to remain faithful, and you have to pray for your sin when you fall short. Repent and pray, or repent and confess those sins. So if anybody needs uh, to come for any reason, please come while we stand and sing.